continue that tradition unimpaired. Now, the title of this message today is J. Gresham Machen's response to modernism. And my first answer to the question of how he responded is that his most enduring response were two institutions. It was not his intention. That wasn't the way he was responding for 20 years. But the most enduring response has been Westminster Seminary, which today I believe is a remarkably influential institution in evangelicalism and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which after 56 years has 188 churches and only 19,000 members, but may in fact have a wider influence than the numbers would signify, though probably they are a part of what Oz said this morning was the reform tradition's failure to reform. Where did this warrior come from? Who was this man who came on the scene in the PCUSA and left their seminary and were kicked out of their denomination and formed Westminster in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church? What shaped him? What was his engagement with modernism over the 20 years while he taught, 23 years at Princeton? And what is this thing called modernism that he so energetically Posed, and can we learn anything from him today? John Gresham Machen was born in 1881, 16 years after the end of the Civil War. His mother was from Macon, Georgia, and was educated, cultured. She wrote a book called uh, The Bible in Browning, and his father was a very well-to-do lawyer in Baltimore. That's where he grew up. He was, in a word, a well-to-do Southern aristocrat. He made at least six journeys to Europe in those days when there were no planes flying, sailing. The family had a retreat house in Seal Harbor. He went to university school for boys, studied Latin from the time he was 11. They belonged to the Southern Aristocratic Presbyterian Church, Franklin Street. His uh, ways of thinking about black people were Southern Quote, the servants are the real old-fashioned, kind-hearted southern darkies in the house. He was a man gripped by the southern culture in which he grew up. And when he was 21 years old, he inherited $50,000 from his maternal, his maternal grandfather. To put that in perspective, his first annual salary at Princeton was $2,000. So he inherited 25 times an annual salary when he was 21 and a similar amount when he was 35 from his father when he died. He was a millionaire in our terms. And that explains how you could read in his biography over and over again that he funded the magazine. He funded the 250,000 books that were mailed out to the PCUSA and so on. When he died, his estate was $250,000 in those days dollars. That carries with it tremendous limitations, and it defines in large measure the level at which he engaged his culture and the level at which he engaged the PC USA. When he finished high school, he went to Johns Hopkins, studied classics, and then kicking and screaming almost, he went to Princeton Seminary for three years, not at all intending to go into the ministry, didn't know whether he would or not, took a year in Germany to study New Testament, and there he met modernism, as he came to understand it, for the first time in vital, compelling, winsome form in the person of Wilhelm Hermann at Marburg. Uh, it was an almost compelling, overwhelming encounter. This is important because what Machen was doing for the next 23 years when he opposed modernism was not throwing rocks over a wall that he'd never glimpsed over. He had been over the wall into the camp and almost was lost there to the cause. I'm going to read an extended series of quotes from the letters home just to show you how close we came as evangelicals to losing him 
and what an impact this man Hermann had on him and what it should teach us about the way we present our theology. Princeton almost lost him because of the way they presented their theology. Here's the quotes. The first time I heard Hermann may almost be described as an epoch in my life. Such an overpowering personality I think I almost never before encountered. Overpowering in the sincerity of religious devotion. My chief feeling with reference to him is already one of deepest reverence. I have been thrown... Now, this is a man who does not believe in the resurrection, doesn't believe in the infallibility of the scriptures, doesn't believe in the virgin birth. Okay? This is a modernist. I have been thrown all into confusion by what he says. So much deeper is his devotion to Christ than anything I have known in myself during the past few years. The Princeton years. Hermann affirms very little of which I have been accustomed to regard as essential to Christianity. Yet there is no doubt in my mind that he is a Christian and a Christian of a peculiarly earnest type. He is a Christian not because he follows Christ as a moral teacher, but because of his trust in Christ practically if anything more truly than theoretically, his trust is unbounded. Hermann represents the dominant Richelieu school. Hermann has shown me something of the religious power which lies back of this great movement which is now making a fight even for the control of the Northern Presbyterian Church in America. In New England, those who do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus are, generally speaking, religiously dead. In Germany, Hermann has taught me this is by no means the case. He believes that Jesus is the one thing in all the world that inspires absolute confidence and absolute joyful subjection. And that through Jesus, we come into communion with the living God and are made free from the world. It is the, the faith that is a real experience, a real revelation of God that saves, not the faith that consists in accepting as true a lot of dogmas on the basis of merely what others have said. Das Verkehr des Christen mit Gott is one of the greatest religious books I have ever read. Perhaps Hermann does not give the whole truth. I certainly hope he does not. That little phrase is so hope-giving as you read the history of this man. I certainly hope. I think underlying, this, this is a token of the way God works, I believe, as young men experience doubts. Underlying these intellectual doubts that he was being plummeted into, there was what Jonathan Edwards would probably call a, an affection, a nose. that didn't operate here mainly. A nose and an affection for the truth so that Periodically, as he's expressing his fascination with these new ideas, he keeps inserting, I hope it's not true. I hope it isn't true. Because there was this gut level, I have loved what Warfield taught, I think. I certainly hope he does not. At any rate, he has gotten hold of something that has been sadly neglected in the church and in the orthodox theology. Perhaps he is something like the devout mystics of the Middle Ages. They were one-sided enough, but they raised a mighty protest against the coldness and deadness of the church and were forerunners of the Reformation." End quote. Now, what Machen found in Hermann, I think, was something that he had apparently not found at Princeton, nor in his home church, Franklin Street, nor in his mother, whom he loved dearly and counted as a saint, namely, passion, joy, exuberant trust. At Princeton, there was solid learning, there was civil, formal, careful, aristocratic, presentations of fairly cool, thorough, reformed theology. He eventually came to see that that theology was an infinitely better foundation for joy than what Hermann had. 
But in comparison to Hermann's spirit, 